Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the Brookings Institution. I appreciate you're all here on time, despite the time change. So that was, that's impressive, a highly intelligent audience. Anyway, it's uh, my great pleasure to be uh, moderating and I guess introducing uh, these three gentlemen here who have uh, produced this fascinating book called Bending History, Barack Obama's Foreign Policy. Um, there's nothing uh, more difficult uh, than trying to write what is in effect contemporary history uh, to analyze an administration while it is still in place. Uh, such an action endeavor must be taken with a bit of modesty and humility, and these gentlemen have all uh, uh, displayed that, I think. Um, everyone knows that things are going to be seen differently uh, in the future than they have been, than they may be now. Um, I'm reminded of a book that I recall from the Reagan years uh, by Doyle McManus and Jane Mayer called Landslide, and it was written sort of right at the height of the Iran-Contra crisis, and the, the basic thesis of the book was that Reagan's presidency was finished, he was going to go down in history as a total disaster, um, and I always look back on that as one of the perils of trying to predict the future based on what is happening at exactly this moment. So, um, but I think uh, uh, all these authors are aware of that issue as they've approached this. Let me just introduce um, uh, the authors. Uh, on my right is Martin Indyk. I guess they're all on my right. Uh, Vice President, Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, my boss, all of our bosses. So I have to interview my boss here, tell him what he thinks, ask him what he thinks about his book. Uh, Ken Lieberthal, <laughs> Director of the John L. Thornton China Center, Senior Fellow in Foreign Policy and Global Economy and Development at Brookings. And uh, on the far right is uh, Mike O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow in Foreign Policy at Brookings, where he specializes in U.S. defense strategy, use of military force, homeland security, and American foreign policy. Um, all of these uh, gentlemen are uh, highly experienced. Uh, they've been practitioners as well as scholars and bring uh, a real wealth of understanding, I think, uh, and particularly in dealing with an issue like this, what is the how to, uh, trying to evaluate a president's foreign policy, they bring a lot of historical and comparative understanding. Because I think uh, it's very easy to look at uh, a presidency <coughs> either in isolation <coughs> or only in comparison to the last <coughs> presidency. Uh, but of course, <coughs> there is a broader historical context in, in which this, um, in which we have to look at the Obama administration, and this book uh, really does put it in that context. So I thought I would just um, ask the try to start a discussion here, talk about some of the issues that are raised in the book, and then ultimately uh, open it up to you for, for your questions as well. Um, I wanted to start with the, the basic concept that, um, uh, and Martin, maybe I'll ask you to, to describe the concept. I think you describe um, Obama as a pragmatic progressive. A progressive pragmatic? A, which, which is it? Progressive pragmatist. A, a progressive pragmatist. Is that different from a pragmatic progressive? We'll have to explore that. But the, the, the answer is no. The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm always, I have to say, I'm always suspicious when I hear the word pragmatic. Uh, because in the first place, people generally think that whatever they're doing is pragmatic and whatever people who disagree with them is doing is not pragmatic. But, but more generally, I always want to know, pragmatic into what end? What is the purpose of pragmatism? I don't think, it seems to me a tactic rather than uh, a doctrine. And it seems to me that pragmatism ought to head in some direction. In the book, I often see the, the, uh, the definition of pragmatism seems to be maintaining good relations with dictators. That's, that's described as a pragmatic uh, policy on several occasions in this book. But, but having said that, why don't you, I'd love to hear what your, your definition of that uh, phrase is. Well, first, first of all, um, the title of the book, Bending History, um, is taken or is an adaptation of uh, President Obama's uh, favorite quotation. He even has it embroidered in his rug in the Oval Office, which is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. from his famous speech in Montgomery, Alabama, in which he was asking rhetorically, how long, how long uh, will it take? And he says, how long? He says, not long, because the uh, arc of the moral universe is long, 
but it bends towards justice. And the fact that this is Barack Obama's favourite quote, and he uses it, as we explain in the book, on several uh, very important occasions, like when uh, Hosni Mubarak uh, steps down as president of, of Egypt. Uh, it's, it's a, I think, emblematic of the president's uh, own view of what he is trying to achieve. And that's the progressive side of him. As, uh, as, as Mike can explain in greater detail, he, he spent a lot of time on the campaign trail, uh, not just distinguishing himself from George W. Bush, but laying out a vision, uh, a broad and dramatic vision, not just for changing the country, but for changing the world, for improving the world. And this is Barack Obama's progressive vision, in which he sees a more humble United States adjusting to the changes in the balance of power in a way that would preserve the liberal international order that you have uh, uh, spoken so much about in your recent book, uh, but would do so in the process of shaping an emerging global order that involves new powers, in particular China, uh, but others as well, India and, and Turkey. Um, but uh, in the process, uh, maintains the liberal international order and bends it towards justice and freedom and, and uh, progress and prosperity. And, and that vision, uh, which he sold to the American people and he sold to to much of the world as well, um, not surprisingly, was not that easy to implement, especially when he, he faced uh, on day one uh, the Great Recession and had to uh, focus on that uh, necessarily. But all the time, all along the way, we see him looking for the opportunities to advance this vision, uh, but doing it in a way that is pragmatic. <clears throat> uh, Mike uh, coined the term a reluctant realist. So it's pragmatic in the sense of being re a realist in his approach. Uh, but he's not just adjusting to events and um, trying to do the best he can. Um, we do feel that he has a, 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 a strong sense of where he wants to take America and the world. And what, what has emerged in his first three years is that, that there is a considerable gap between the vision and, and the result. Uh, and that's partly because of who he is, because he's not just a progressive, not just a liberal. He is a pragmatist. He is a compromiser. Uh, and we see that so much in, in the way that he handles domestic politics but you see it very clearly in the way he handles foreign policy. And we could make the argument that that's, the, that's good, that's been good for the country. And we do uh, argue that, you know, in terms of bottom line, the nation's interests have been fairly well protected. But there's no breakthrough moment. There's, there's no inspirational, transformational events um, under this presidency. Uh, what there is, and I think he would accept this, is kind of slow progress where he can make it towards the overall objective of improving the world. Uh, Mike, you want to jump in, but let me pose this. I mean, in theory, is it possible that ultimately the pragmatism overwhelms the progressivism that the, that the, or, or the progressivism undoes the pragmatism? I mean, it's a very... It's a very nice to postulate a perfect balance between pragmatism and progressivism, but in the real world, of course, they, they, may, they may clash. Uh, and I think it might even, it, you might even point to instances in this administration where they've clashed. But do you want to take a, take a crack at that and expand on what Martin's been saying? Yeah, I'll add a word there. And I thought Martin did a very good job of summarizing the generally favorable review of how we believe he's handled near-term issues. But I think on broader issues of grand strategy and vision, he really has been, in a sense, too ambitious. Now, to some extent, the world intervened, and he had to deal with crises uh, and immediate challenges that, in some cases, were greater than he could have possibly anticipated when he began his campaign for president. 
In other cases, are just what any president ultimately does in dealing with an inbox. But I do think that having sold a big visions about dramatically reducing global poverty and doubling foreign aid to help do that, about repairing the breach with the United States and the Islamic world, pursuing nuclear disarmament, not just nonproliferation, but disarmament as a goal, uh, ending global warming, or at least making a major dent on that, and having all these big ideas on his campaign in a way that, frankly, he was so good at the rhetoric that people found it believable that he was going to try to do all these things. He created an expectations gap. And it does set up, I think, a challenge for him in his remaining year in the first term, and if he wins re-election, about what will his final big priority be? And is it time now to try to emphasize one of those big goals uh, <coughs> as, as opposed to just using the five or six dramatic visions as the cornerstones of speeches, but not really using them in governance very much? And uh, of all those things, we now have to add one more, which is, and this is where we end the book, which is the en enduring severity of the American financial and economic crisis, because without making headway on that, and it's obviously not just a problem for him, it's a problem of how Washington works and the country works, without doing that, he can't do anything else, ultimately, in terms of pursuing his big vision. And as Ken Lieberthal, I think, has really well emphasized, especially in talking about East Asia in the book, we're already perceived as a substantially weaker power, despite all this rebalancing toward Asia, which I think was pretty well done, despite a lot of the tactical moves that Jeff Bader and others have very well carried out, but we are still in a fundamentally perilous position at a time when we have trillion dollar deficits. That's not compatible in the end with a strong or enduring foreign policy uh, record. So uh, we're generally favorable, I'm generally favorable on Obama and what he's done so far, but when you raise the question of the big visions and of where he wants to go, he does have this fundamental challenge that continues to face him. Well, probably all presidents, and when they're running for office, lay out big visions that they don't accomplish. I'm not. I'd be curious to get your view as to how different Obama is than anybody else in that regard. But let me let's turn to Ken because, Ken, I, I read uh, I read all this. I read the whole book carefully, but I've looked throughout your chapter in particular on China, looking for the word pragmatic, and I really only found it once. Uh, I didn't have a computer search. I was actually reading the book. And I, and, I, and I found it in relation to the economic strategy of, of uh, Secretary of the Treasury Geithner. I did not find any use of the word pragmatic in terms of the overall strategy toward China, particularly on the geopolitical level, uh, particularly with regard to the pivot. And in fact, the major point that you make, it seems to me, is that there is a, a, a gap and potentially a big gap between what the administration has promised uh, in the region and what it is capable of delivering. And that would seem to me to be a highly unpragmatic approach. Do you want to expand on that point? No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I will continue uh, sure. expressing <laughs> your view of... Uh, yeah. uh, uh, seriously, the pragmatism comes in. You're right, I don't use the term constantly, but... Uh, or at all. The, uh, or at all. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, the, the pragmatism comes in as you look at the entire analysis of what he did toward China. He came in uh, hoping to bring China to top table on global issues. Given China's rapid uh, uh, acceleration up the global table of uh, big, big powers uh, with interests around the world, uh, he felt that we had to move from dealing with them primarily on bilateral issues and issues right around their periphery to dealing with them on the major global issues of the era, uh, the financial crisis, nuclear nonproliferation, climate change, et cetera. Uh, and then you see an evolution of his dealing with China as the Chinese basically proved uh, not sufficiently responsive on those global issues and then became more assertive in Asia as a region. And so you see him begin to build uh, uh, to put greater emphasis on um, stitching together an Asian-wide strategy, including China, but also with enormous attention to India, to Indonesia, to Japan, South Korea, et cetera. So I think it's in the evolution of his thinking about China that you see mm -hmm. is, a, is innate pragmatism. Yep. Uh, we conclude with his articulation of this Asian strategy, which was highlighted most, most clearly in his November 2011 trip, uh, to Honolulu, Indonesia, and Australia. And there the concern is the one that Mike ended up on, which is to say on the one hand, he laid out a, uh, a set of initiatives, a relatively integrated set of initiatives that were diplomatic, security, economic, and also advancement of democracy. And it was really impressive, frankly. It kind of highlighted that despite some 
skepticism in the region, America can walk and chew gum at the same time, and it's going to be around for a long time, and we can get our mojo back, right? The soft underbelly of that is the question of credibility. Are we going to be able to pull that off? And the assessment in the book is ultimately probably the biggest single factor there will be whether we can get our domestic housing order. Uh, everyone in the region, as people in the United States and elsewhere around the world, uh, appreciate that America has never been outstanding for avoiding domestic problems and domestic missteps. Our unique capability has been in making the adjustments necessary to confront domestic crises, uh, resolve the crisis, and emerge stronger than we were before because of the adjustments we've made. I mean, it's the nature of our system to be able to do that unusually well. The big question now is whether we've lost that capability, you know, or whether it's eroded enough. Uh, or will we get it back, bounce back, in which case everything he's tried to do in Asia is perfectly credible. So we conclude saying effectively, you know, this whole book is about foreign policy, rightly so. But let's not forget at the end of the day, you can't have a robust strategic foreign policy unless you have domestic credibility in your domestic housing order. So. But the chapter also talks uh, about, um, and I think is critical of the administration, at least implicitly, uh, at creating a kind of feedback loop where uh, the Chinese are worried about the United States trying to hem them in. Uh, the administration is worried about China overplaying its hand. The administration response feeds Chinese concerns, which feed Chinese behavior, and you refer to it as a closed loop. So uh, it seems to me if you add that idea that I think you're basically effectively saying that the administration's especially more recent policies are increasing tension in the relationship, including the increasing emphasis on democracy, which is the, the particularly neuralgic point uh, for the Chinese regime, uh, is increasing tension while at the same time not necessarily having the resources uh, to back up uh, a situation of increasing tension. Well, look, that know, seems to me, I would, yeah. say, I would say that's a pretty strong indictment of a China policy, uh, if you think about re even recent presidents. Um, I guess life is complicated. You know, uh, <laughs> the democracy side of this came into the, you know, Obama has not had that at the center of his foreign policy for most of his administration. It's been there, but it's not been a central focus, unlike, say, the George W. Bush administration that said, you know, we're all about pro democracy promotion. The Arab Spring obviously forced this to a more central place than global foreign policy. And then in Asia, developments in Burma drew the administration into democracy promotion in Asia, or the rhetoric of that and the actual uh, efforts vis-a-vis -vis Burma. Uh, you're right, to the Chinese, this is especially neuralgic. Obama has not pressed this with China. He's raised it constantly, but not <coughs> made it by any means a, the center of his policy toward China. But it worries the Chinese when America has democracy promotion high on its agenda because they see that as regime change in China. And let me say, as Obama has tried to put together an Asian strategy, coping, by the way, with a more activist China in the region and one that harbors deep structural distrust about American long-term intentions. I mean, they fundamentally think that America is number one, China is now number two. It, it is an article of faith that number one is going to try to prevent number two from ever becoming number one. And that, that casts everything we do in a kind of very suspicious light in their mind. He has worked very hard on building personal bridges to the leadership of China, uh, trying to engage the Chinese across the board. But I will say at the end of the day, I think this distrust over long-term intentions that has actually grown in the last few years. Uh, I think it's something that very much needs more attention than it's gotten to date, and more creative attention on both sides, uh, or we are potentially headed for very serious problems a decade from now. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about the, um, the increasing emphasis on democracy that's occurred uh, in the administration, and I think you're, it, it makes sense that it's probably response to what's happened in the Arab, uh, in terms of the Arab Spring. And maybe Martin, um, I'd like, I'm wondering if you'd like. I to thought take... it was a response to your constant lobbying on this. Well, no, that's right, because we all know that I, my ability to influence successive administrations is overwhelming. So, um, uh, would, but would you like to take a, uh, give us your thoughts? Because I know it's a complex picture in the book. I have to say, one of the really uh, 
good things about this book, which I commend everyone, is it's actually a, a very meticulous walking through of what's happened. It, it is the best kind of contemporary uh, diplomatic and strategic history. Um, and, and I found that the, uh, this is true in all the chapters, but I, I was particularly struck by uh, the, the way the book walks through the various stages of the administration's response to the Arab Spring. And, and not surprisingly, because I think it's common, it, it, would, it would be odd if it were not true, but the response has been a kind of mixed picture in terms of how the administration has, has approached the Arab Spring. I'm wondering if you'd like to give us a, a bit of a, an outline of, of how it looks to you. Well, as uh, Ken has already suggested, it's complicated. Um, Barack Obama did not uh, make democracy promotion, especially in the Middle East, um, a, uh, an objective of his uh, foreign policy. In fact, democracy promotion more generally is not uh, something that he uh, saw as important, particularly because he was uh, trying to distinguish himself from, from the... Uh, what he saw, I think, as the disastrous efforts of Bush to try to promote democracy in the Middle East, um, and and so you see it, you see it in the in the national security strategy uh, paper that that they put, uh, that the White House put out. It's it's kind of referred to on page thirty five of a forty eight page document, um, and it really basically lays out a justification for how to work with authoritarian regimes rather than overthrow them. Um, and so it certainly wasn't on it, uh, his agenda for the Middle East in particular, where his first priority was uh, resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, which we can get back to, but is, is the, the clearest failure of his foreign policy to date. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, the people of, of the Arab world start to come out in the streets, starting in Tunisia and then spreading quickly to Egypt and, and across the whole region, demanding freedom, democracy, uh, accountable government, the very things that we as Americans hold dear. And I think here, at that particular moment, the president uh, made a strategic judgment that uh, was correct, in my view, and, and critically important. Um, it had several elements. First was, this is not about us. Um, this, is, this is Arabs demanding a change in their governments. And we need to get out of the way. Uh, and that, I think, was critically important. That we not become the story, because it could easily have happened that way. Uh, that we need, <coughs> the corollary of that is that we need to be on the side of the people, and we need to be on the right side of history, is the way he, he saw it. And, and the, the critical way of, of manifesting uh, that strategy was to push Mubarak out the door, or to help the Egyptian people push Mubarak out the door. And, and uh, that was not just uh, in terms of how how he wanted to position the United States in the face of a revolution that was going on in the Arab world, but also was important in the Egyptian case because uh, in the process, and I describe this in detail, he is not, I don't think it's very well understood, that, that he also made the judgment that it was critically important in terms of our strategic interests in the region that we preserve, help to preserve the role of the Egyptian military to be, the, the, as it were, the, the midwives of a democratic transition. Now, it didn't quite work out that well, but he at least did actively engage with the military and get them not to fire on the people and to preserve their role uh, as, as the agents for, for change. Um, and, and so... Well, you know, why do I say Egypt's most important? It's, it's because it's the largest, most powerful, culturally most important, geostrategically most, <coughs> most centrally located country in the, in the Arab world. It, you know, one in four Arabs is an Egyptian. And it's the cornerstone of our whole strategy for maintaining stability in a volatile but vital part of the world. So what happens in Egypt is really important. And, and he... 
he, at, at the outset, he basically got that right. Now, it didn't work out so well because the Egyptian military turned out to be feckless and, and useless and counterproductive, and, and there's not a lot that we've been able to do about that. Uh, but the, the basic the theory of the case was right, and, and uh, I think he deserves credit uh, for that. Uh, but across the region, it became also a lot more complicated. In Bahrain, where you had uh, a good <coughs> one quarter of the population of the country in the streets and occupying that, that uh, pearl circle, uh, he, he took the other approach, which was to back the, the king and the royal family against the demonstrators. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, 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 tension between, on the one hand, promoting our values in Egypt, and on the other hand, protecting our interests in the oil-rich Persian Gulf by essentially allow and not standing up to the Saudis when they f sent their forces in uh, to suppress the demonstrators uh, was, you know, I think uh, in a way you could justify it as the right judgment at the time, but it really did create this kind of tension between our values and our interests, which we can't get away from in the Middle East. It's always been a problem. Up until the revolutions, we were totally focused on protecting our interests and in bed with all the autocratic regimes and the kings and the sheikhs and the, the Mubaraks to protect it. Now we couldn't do that anymore, so we had to find a way to balance values with interests. And in the case of Bahrain, it was all about the oil and so it was all about protecting uh, our interests <coughs> in stability there. In the case of Libya, which was uh, a strategic sideshow for the United States, he could... Um, promote our values by helping to protect the Libyan people and helping to overthrow Gaddafi. In Syria, which is the issue du jour, um, our interests and our values coincide in, in our view in terms of uh, helping the uh, Syrian people overthrow a, a horrendously brutal regime. But on the other hand, uh, or, or I should say, on the same hand, strategically, uh, this would deal a, a devastating blow to Iran because Assad is Iran's conduit to influence in the Arab-Israeli heartland. So our strategic interests and our values coincide here in supporting um, the people of Syria in their desire to overthrow the regime. Uh, and yet the president has been reticent uh, in terms, first of all, of calling for the overthrow and in terms of actively engaging in, in the effort. And, and uh, I've already been too long in this answer, but, but I think that uh, that's a mistake. Uh, I, I, I think it comes from a, uh, an awareness on his part and within the White House of this factor that we point to, of, of the gap between his, his uh, vision or his rhetoric and the ability to produce results. In the case of Libya, he, did, he called for the overthrow of Gaddafi and he achieved that. In the case of Syria, he's called for the overthrow, but he does, uh, you know, he does not want to put forward the means <coughs> to actually achieve that. <coughs> Military intervention, from his point of view, is off the table. Um, and... and uh, you know, it's difficult to see without some kind of military intervention, I think Turkish military intervention, it's going to be possible to, to uh, achieve the declared objective of overthrowing Assad. So in a sense, we've done as best we can, and I think he deserves credit for that, in a very complicated, fast-moving situation in which we don't have a lot of control. <coughs> but... Uh, uh, the, the story on Syria is, is unfinished and I, for one, would like to see him being a lot more assertive than he is. Well, maybe we'll get to that in a second. I mean, but as I was reading that section of the book where uh, the book, again, marches very 
methodically through the various phases of President Obama's policy towards Syria, including what I would have characterized as a very pragmatic decision not to get too far out in front uh, for several months. Um, but then, of course, he does call for Assad uh, last August. Uh, he does call for Assad to depart, um, which is not then followed up by any particular decisive strategy to get that. Um, I don't know where does that fall in your continuum between pragmatism and progressivism. I mean, I think I know what the answer is. But, um, uh, and lying behind all this, so I think I'll, 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 let me go to Mike for a second because... A pivot? Uh, let me pivot over to Mike, <laughs> right. Um, which does not imply leaving you in any way. Um, <laughs> and Mike has always been here. We never left him in the first place. So. And, and, and I want to I add another element because I, I have to say if I had one critique... Uh, of this excellent book, I would say there's not enough politics in it. There's not enough President Obama as a political figure and a political actor as well as a decision maker and a strategic thinker. And I want to pick up on the point that you just made. The, the, the president walked himself out rhetorically as far as you can go on Syria. But the White House, and I would say particularly in election year, is loath to, to contemplate another military action. Now, Mike, you talk a lot about, uh, I mean, you have, and this book addresses, you all address at great length, uh, the wars that the president has uh, tried to wind down, uh, and yet the president um, uh, did order an intervention in Libya, which I think most people were surprised. I'm not going to tell my John McCain joke again, but um, that was kind of a surprise. Uh, where is the president now on the whole idea of the use of force? James Traub wrote in... Uh, uh, the New York Times recently, that it's the end of intervention. There's, there's not going to be any more interventions. Um, but where do you think the president actually is uh, as a theoretical matter, as a, as, a, as a matter of principle and theory, on the idea of using force? Thanks, Bob. And of course, this does get to the crux of the dilemma you pointed out earlier about contemporary history, because I sense that the president's views have evolved during his time in office. And I think that's part of why he's reluctant to be forward leaning on Syria. I think he's a little more tired of war now than he was three years ago, just as the country is. That's not a reason to stay disengaged if uh, immediate security threats are right on the line. And in regard to his Iran stance lately, he's been more clear, I think, that if certain actions were to take place, I interpret them as uh, being making it more likely the United States would militarily intervene. So it's a mixed thing. I think he is a realist in the George H.W. Bush camp in some ways, that he will make a call about whether he sees a, an interest as vital or not, and his military thinking will uh, be adjusted appropriately and accordingly. So on- We can count on two more major interventions in his term if he's like George H.W. <laughs> Bush. Uh, at that pace, I guess, yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think um, people doubt at this, a lot of people doubt whether he's still got the willingness to use force, but then he talks tough on Iran. He also still happens to have 90,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan on a very sad day, a very sad week in Afghanistan in a war that's been very tough throughout. But we have 90,000 troops still there. Despite the accelerated drawdown, which last June when it was announced I was against uh, and thought it was too fast, it's still worth pointing out we're going to have roughly twice as many troops at the end of his first term in Afghanistan as we did at the beginning of his first term in Afghanistan. And on Iraq, even though a lot of Iraq watchers wanted the United States to find a way to keep forces longer than through 2011, and I was hoping we would too, at the end of the day, Barack Obama kept US forces in Iraq 20 months longer than he had originally promised on the campaign trail. And he only left when the Iraqis themselves said, we're not going to give you a law giving immunity to your troops. Now, some people think he could have found a way, of course, to, to stay anyhow. And perhaps a third term George W. Bush would have. But it's worth <coughs> pointing out that George W. Bush and Prime Minister Maliki are the ones who signed the original deal that would have had US forces leave by the end of 2011. And we give Obama some credit uh, even though we, uh, myself at least, and I think in the book we reflect, there was a logic to trying to stay. Once the Iraqis said, no, thank you, we were right to leave. And so again, Obama, I think, makes his calls case by case. And there is a sense of which interests are vital, which ones are secondary. But there's also a pragmatism. And last point uh, on this quick overview, on Afghanistan, I don't know how to predict his next move. Because the past three years would suggest he's going to be hawkish. 
but I think he's constantly assessing the doability of the mission. And he also knows that al-Qaeda has been largely decimated on his watch, to some extent to his credit, to some extent, of course, to the credit of our broader intelligence and military communities. Uh, and therefore, frankly, the stakes in Afghanistan may be a notch below what he thought and what we all thought three years ago. So I think he will continue to assess not just uh, you know, where we've been on Afghanistan and where he's been, but what's doable in the future. He's very, in that sense, sorry, very pragmatic. Can, can I just address the politics uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, point here, which, which is the other side of your question, is that, that clearly as he, as he uh, prepared to, to move into election mode again, uh, he wanted to be able to be the president who was ending wars in the Middle East and not starting new ones. And, and I think that was a very political judgment. He also made a political judgment that he wasn't uh, going to keep on pushing the Israeli-Palestinian issue because that was bad politics here. And he, he just dropped it like, like a hot potato, turned his back on it. Um, but, and and uh, you could say that Afghanistan is, is exactly as Mike says, an, an indication of his, his realism and his willingness to use force, and in particular, a willingness uh, to go after um, al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, in, in a very uh, tough and effective way. And, and we give him credit for all of that. But it is also, Afghanistan is also a story of going in to get out. And, and the, the policy, uh, the effectiveness of the policy was affected by his desire, on the one hand, to be tough and to be seen to be tough, to give him a kind of political... Teflon coating against the Republican charge that he was weak and feckless. They're still charging it anyway, but it's not going anywhere. But on the one hand, the desire to be seen to be tough, but on the other hand, for his own base to be seen to be ending wars rather than prolonging them. And, and so I think Afghanistan policy was affected by that political calculation. Let, let me add an Asian dimension to the politics side of this, uh, which is I think that at least in terms of the packaging of his November trip last year, we articulated this Asia strategy, it was in no small part to highlight that this administration is now delivering. We're not only exiting from wars, we've now got our attention where our biggest opportunities are, and we know what we're doing, and we're very forward-leaning and dynamic. Also on China, I think from the start, the president has had a very, very jaundiced view of China's economic and trade policy. So he's, you know, this has been an area that's been very neuralgic for him. But I think the rhetoric has gotten knocked up a notch uh, because, A, he thinks those policies are reducing his capacity to generate the jobs that he feels he needs for America and to be reelected. Uh, and, B, he wants to be seen very clearly as strongly defending American economic and trade interests here. So he's at it full, you know, full bore this year. Well, let's, let's, let's do a little bit of prediction because you, you, you guys have been now steeped in Obama's brain. You, you, want, you, you as, as well as anyone, I would say, you know where he's been and have watched him evolve and have written very intelligently about it. Let's, for the sake of argument, say that uh, he's elected and has a second term. Uh, my rough reading on history is that it's often the case that presidents wind up defining their foreign policy legacy more in a second term than they did in the first. I would say that was true of the Clinton administration. Um, I would say it was true of the Reagan administration. A lot of, sometimes it's because what they started in the first term bear fruit in the second. Sometimes it's because events change, they shift. In any case, let's look ahead to a, to a second term. And, and let me ask you, uh, Martin, uh, some very bald questions. Will Barack Obama use force against Iran in a second term? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> moving on. Do you want to? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, no, he think... said yes. Don't back <laughs> off. You're all witnesses. <laughs> I've, I, I've thought for a long time that, that um, Barack Obama uh, will end up uh, using force in a preventive strike on, on Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, and it's not to do with politics. It's very much to do with his progressive vision of, a, of this uh, role of the United States in shaping uh, a multilateral uh, global order. Um, 
non-proliferation is a fundamental pillar of that order. And uh, he, uh, as president in his second term, is not going to be the one to preside over the collapse of that pillar, which he sees, and he's laid it out in this Atlantic Monthly interview that he did last week, uh, he sees as, as threatened now. The collapse of that pillar is threatened by Iran's determination, appears determination, to acquire nuclear weapons capabilities. As he explains it, that would, would uh, if, if unhindered, uh, the Iranian uh, move towards nuclear weapons capability would trigger a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. It would be the, the case of a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty um, actually acquiring nuclear weapons, notwithstanding its obligations. And, and in that context, I think he <coughs> is not prepared to tolerate that. And he's trying to make that very clear to the Iranians now by taking containment off the table which, again, he did last week, he's basically saying, look, you guys have got a choice. You either give up your nuclear weapons aspirations or if you keep on going down that road, I will use force against you. Um, and so that's why I say that's, that's the, the direction we're moving. And, of course, you know, in terms of second-term work, it's deeply ironic because, in effect, what, what and this is what we say at the end of the book, is what's emerging out of this progressive pragmatism or reluctant realism is a strategy uh, to rebalance and focus US interests on Asia, East Asia in particular, and where Ken has described a, a strategy that is fairly coherent uh, and could work. Um, and it's described in some quarters of the administration as a pivot. Well, if you pivot towards something, you're pivoting away from something. And what he's pivoting away from is the Middle East. And, uh, and that's, you know, he's ending two wars in the greater Middle East. Uh, he's dropped the effort to resolve the Palestinian problem. And I don't see him picking it up again. We can get back to that if you want to. And the, the under, underlying little secret that people are kind of finally waking up to is that in his second term, we will no longer need Middle Eastern oil. We only import 10% from the Middle East today, from the Gulf. China and India will be highly dependent. And, of course, we will still have an interest in the free, free flow of oil. But, but uh, the idea of, in effect, turning his back on the Middle <coughs> East and focusing on our interests in Asia is, I think, um, where he wants to take the United States in his second term. And that's why I say it would be ironic indeed if for the sake of preserving the non-proliferation pillar of the new international order, he ends up starting a third war in the Middle East. Well, it will not only be ironic, it would seem to be to be disruptive of his strategy. Um, I don't see exactly how, especially at a time when our military resources are constrained, uh, he can undertake a war. And I mean, it's not just a quick war, and it doesn't end when we finish shooting. So that'll be a major recommitment to that region. And then at the same time, um, maintain this uh, allegedly exalt, you know, increased position in East Asia. But Ken, you wanted to jump in. Uh, yeah, if I look ahead uh, on the East Asia side in this strategy, it seems to me there are three huge variables. Okay. One is exactly what Martin just said which is to say all of, all of this is premised, at least in part, on being able to shift our attention to the Middle East. Away what, from the, uh, I'm sorry, to East Asia. Uh, and uh, on the military side there, it isn't a commitment to build up military resources. It's a commitment not to reduce military resources when they're being reduced globally. Right? Uh, but if we get sucked back into the Middle East in a major commitment, that obviously has enormous uh, potential repercussions. Two other things are going to uh, affect this. One is that we're going to be changing our team. Even if Obama is reelected, <coughs> Secretary Clinton has played a huge role in Asian strategy, and some of her key staff have been very dynamic on this, uh, and they're going to leave. Uh, so, you know, with new folks in place, you have to ask how, you know, what modifications will occur, including in capability for effective execution. And then finally, I come back to what Mike raised at the beginning, which is to say uh, elections are 
the American equivalent of Chinese five-year plans. You know, they kind of say, this is where we're headed for the next few years. If this election, no matter who wins, enables us to get back on our game economically, build confidence that we will get ahead of our fiscal train wreck that's going to hit us a decade from now if we don't start really moving ahead on it now. If it enables <coughs> us to do that, then we're going to be much more effective in an Asian strategy. If it doesn't, if we look as dysfunctional in this city after the election as we were before, uh, you know, a lot is going to change in the second term in directions that Obama does not want to see occur. You know? Let me just ask you quickly, flashpoints that could erupt the known unknowns uh, in East Asia well, I, over the next four sure. years. The biggest known unknown in East Asia is North Korea. And it appears that the succession there has gone more smoothly than many anticipated. Uh, but this is a complicated place. We don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, and uh, if things really began to melt down there, it would change the future of Northeast Asia for a long time to come. Uh, just the dynamics are so dangerous there. The other big unknown in the region, frankly, it, we know more about it, but at the end of the day, a huge array of uh, judgments on it, is how dynamic China is going to remain. You know, we talk about our own economic difficulties or our need to change some pretty basic things. The Chinese recognize full well they need to adopt a new development model. The model that served them so well for 30 years has now largely run its course and is producing increasingly negative outcomes there. In their typical fashion, they've adopted a five-year plan that lays out the new model. It's very unclear whether they have the political capability to actually implement it, given vested interest in the system and that kind of thing. And if they don't, the forces of instability in China grow. And again, no, one, no one's ever been very good at predicting the future um, when things might actually become a major problem. But the Chinese are certainly worried about it. And if they do trip up, a lot of the current glib expectations about the politics of the region will have to be recalibrated quite mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. And Mike, uh, Afghanistan in a second term, uh, get out as quickly as possible, uh, recalibrate, try to uh, um, stay in and, and achieve some acceptable outcome, especially in the wake of, uh, of the shootings and the Koran burning and the general and the, the rising polls in the United States which show Americans have tired uh, long since tired of this conflict. What does is, what is Barack Obama do in a second term in Afghanistan? Well, I think he will have made his big decisions before such a term because I think they'll be made primarily, not exclusively, in the next two to four months as he decides what happens after <coughs> September when we get down to that 68,000 U.S. troop number, which, as I mentioned before, will still be twice the number of American forces we had in Afghanistan as when he was inaugurated. Uh, but the question is, and I think it's no particular secret among leaders in Afghanistan that they would like to see a bit of plateauing in our presence for a while. There's a lot of work left to do. There is a campaign plan in Afghanistan. There's a sequence of events that's being carried out, uh, as you know, and a big part of the focus now is, is the east of the country, where we've never had the resources that we really wanted. Stan McChrystal didn't get his full array of forces as requested in the fall of 2009. And then uh, after that, last spring, President Obama accelerated the drawdown, meaning that the East remained deprived of the forces originally intended for it. So the campaign plan requires us to do some work in the East and then the highway from Kabul to Kandahar, and then, of course, keep building up the Afghan army and police. And that implies, frankly, a fair amount of hard work through uh, 2013 and into 2014. And I think the president's going to essentially decide in the next few months whether he still believes in that campaign plan. Mm -hmm. I think at the moment we can't be sure. Uh, and obviously, commanders in the field, ambassadors in the field don't get to make these decisions. Presidents do. And I think uh, Obama's, at this moment, sorting through how he feels about these questions. I, I must say I'm, I'm somewhat surprised at that answer because it seems to me, I understand presidents running for re-election have one view of how they feel about a, a conflict they're in. Then they get to be president for another four years and they have to preside over whatever decision they've made. Uh, which, if they've made a certain kind of decision that is unsuccessful, may mean, uh, in theory at least, the United States heading out of Afghanistan with its tail between its legs on his watch. Um, and I wonder, is there no way in which he might, as a re-elected second-term president, want to recalibrate where exactly he winds up in Afghanistan? Or, or will he be bound by whatever decisions he's made two months before he's re-elected? Are you saying that there's a chance that he could be, become tougher, more resolute, and more patient on Afghanistan once reelected? 
I'm asking you whether you think that's a possibility. No, I okay. don't. I, I think that it, if he's decided to cut forces below 68,000 and he does it during this fall's big election campaign season, there's no putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. You will have essentially uh, begun to leave the bases and essentially sent Afghans the message you're not going to partner with them in the field as previously intended. So, I mean, you could always imagine, in theory, sure, if he, you know, if, if he really wanted to just fool us for six weeks, I guess he probably could, and then immediately pull back as of the day after re-election. But I think that as a practical matter, if he decides he's lost faith in the strategy, we're probably going to see evidence of that before Election Day, further cuts that would begin perhaps even in October. And, and I don't think he will reassess that. Now, it doesn't mean he goes down to zero, but it does mean he goes to a primarily one, counter One final submission. question on this. Do you think that he faces a potential helicopter off the roof of an embassy? If I were a journalist, I would be asking that kind of question. A uh, helicopter off the roof of the American embassy moment in his second term? I think there's a chance Afghanistan could fail. Uh, I don't think it's likely to fail quite that way. I think it's more likely that large swaths of the South would go first. But, you know, second terms are long, and uh, there's a lot of time, a lot of things could happen between now and then. So, yeah, there's a chance this mission could simply fail. And uh, I don't think it's likely. Uh, I think even if we get to a poor outcome, it's more likely to be one where there are elements of the country still held by the government, uh, but an increasing sense that the big swaths of territory where al-Qaeda and lashkar e taiba and other terrorist groups could find sanctuary are increasingly beyond the government's control and our control. That would be a pretty mediocre to poor outcome. But it still has the Afghan government in charge of Kabul by most prognostications for most scenarios I could envision. Let me just turn to the Middle East finally, as we, and then we can move on uh, and then ultimately go to questions. Martin, if, if, as, if I read you correctly, I, I, I look at a Middle East in, the, in an Obama second term that includes um, a preemptive, I think is the word, strike against Iran. Um, without a UN Security Council authorization, obviously, because the Russians and Chinese are unlikely to approve a military strike, um, with whatever fallout comes from that mm -hmm. attack in the region. A completely stalled Middle East peace process. I think that you were suggesting that there, you don't anticipate him picking up that uh, hot potato anytime soon. And I suppose, uh, given that uh, you don't think uh, he's going to use force in Syria, and I would imagine you would say partly because he may have to use force in Iran, uh, possibly an ongoing bloody, you know, uh, for at least for the first period of his term, uh, bloody outcome in Syria. Very uncertain situation in Egypt. Um, I'll leave it there, but, you know, we could go on. Um, that's not a very pretty picture for the president's second term. <clears throat> Well, you've described the Middle East, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's the Middle East. I mean, I well, think, given I think that he you're, came you're in, painting it yeah. in, you know. In Am I painting it in too stark a term? Stark terms. Well, yeah. give, it the more, give me the more positive spin. Because, you know, we know in the Middle East something always turns up. Mm -hmm. And it's usually bad. You've described all, <laughs> all the things that could go wrong. But sometimes it's not. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you, you never know. Uh, what currents uh, and, and uh, conflicts are going to produce what kind of opportunities. Uh, I, I, I do think that um, uh, the basic strategy that, that presidents, both Republican and Democrat, have, have employed uh, for the last four decades uh, no longer applies. Uh, the most obvious uh, point about that is that, that Egypt is no longer the stable ally uh, of the United States. The par Egyptian parliament today is debating whether to renounce American military assistance. Um, I don't think the military is going to go along with that, but you know, it, it, it shows you where things are going there. We no longer have an Egyptian pillar on which we can base our strategy. Um, Saudi Arabia it remains a pillar, but it's one... I mean, we have some deep differences with Saudi Arabia about what should happen politically in places like Bahrain and, and other kingdoms. We think they need to get on the road of political reform. The Saudis say, you've got to be kidding me. <coughs> and on the peace process, 
you know, we haven't really really talked about it, but but, but you can talk about it now if you want to. No, this is a good. I don't want to steal your opportunity to well, talk about I, the peace process. I don't want to think the audience yeah. has some questions, but it just, you know, it it it. Uh, I think the president has been so burned by his experience there, um, an experience which is much of his own making, uh, but. Uh, I, I find it hard to imagine that he's going to go back to it unless something dramatic changes, unless you've got a leadership on the Israeli and Palestinian side that are really prepared to take the risk necessary uh, to make peace. And then he can come in and support them, as previous president, presidents have done when he had those circumstances. But looking out there today, that doesn't look very likely. And, and so I think that... that uh, Inevitably, it's, you know, it's the old bicycle theory, so many of you have heard this, that in the Middle East, if you're not pedalling forward, you fall off. And, and we're not pedalling forward. And so one thing or another, whether it's Iran or a flare-up in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or something will drag us back there. Um, but when we, when we are dragged back, we're going to be um, more awkwardly placed than we've been for a long time in terms of trying to preserve our interests and, and try to, uh, to make progress in that part of the world. I must say, I'm, listening to you all talk about a potential second term and, and where things stand, and given that the general approach of the book is to say that Obama's done pretty well, and I'm reminded of that scene in the diner. I don't know whether you all remember the movie. In, in Diner, remember that movie? Uh, the... Uh, a guy's about to get married, Steve Gutenberg's about to get married, and he asks the guy who's married how, how, what married life is like, and, and the guy basically says, well, it's, it's really terrible. I mean, uh, you know, we have nothing to talk about, and we really don't get along. I don't even know why. You know, it was more fun before we were married. And at the end, uh, Gutenberg says, but it's nice, right? And he says, yeah, yeah, it's nice, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of uh, view I get here. Let me just... Bob, if yeah. I can just add a word to yeah. this. Let's face it, what he is coping with, in the, setting aside the Arab-Israeli peace process as a separate issue, uh, what he's coping with in much of the Middle East now is what the Bush administration sought to see occur, which is uh, pro-democracy movements from the bottom up. And the problem with those is you never know where they're going to head. Uh, and the forces of uh, reaction in the Middle East are extremely powerful, be it deeply rooted, and the sectarian issues are very tough issues. So with this having started, you know, you're riding a tiger. Sure. And you just, so, no, no, it's obviously. Tough. All right, one final thing, and then I'm going to open it up to one. Well, give me one more thing, because uh, I, I, I get to be in this role now. I love it. Uh, I, I want you to give two grades to two different presidents, and no, you don't get to grade George W. Bush. <laughs> In your particular areas, yeah. grade Bill Clinton's presidency and Barack Obama's presidency. And we'll start at, at, with Mike. May, may I do it in the first three years of each, or do you want the eight years of Clinton? And the eight years of the full Clinton picture. Uh, in the you can give separate... So you can give term grades if you want. Okay. Well, it's worth Two saying terms, yeah. Obama's been much better than Clinton in his first three years on national security policy. Grade. I'm, I know. But, <laughs> okay. but I, I needed to say that. Uh, over the eight years, I think uh, Clinton increasingly did well. And I'd say on balance, I'll give him a B plus for national security. And, and that's the ballpark of where I am on Obama. Okay. Okay. You know, frankly, Mike wanted us to grade Obama, and I'm the one that refused to right. do it, so it's not in the book. Right. Because uh, I don't believe in that. I would give them both an A minus on China. Okay. okay. Let me say. You're Clinton, grading yourself here, uh, so uh, I realize well, that. You know. I was gonna, let me make that more specific. For Clinton, it's in the second term. I thought his first term, he tripped over himself so much from his own campaign rhetoric right. that he couldn't get China right. Second term, I think, an A minus. So C plus, and then A plus, and then it averaged out to a. Yeah. Okay. I know well, you're I'll, grading yourself too, but <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I'm not objective. Uh, you know, on the Middle East, you, you have to say that uh, I, I think that that Obama deserves pretty much an A, a to A minus on the Arab awakenings. Mm -hmm. I think he's done pretty well in terms of protecting our interests and and, and promoting um, our values. Uh, on on the uh, peace process, there's no there's no way of getting away from it, and and. Uh, I, I should take a powder like him, but it's an F. Okay. I think Obama would, would agree with that. Okay. 
Well, thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to all your questions now. Uh, yes, sir, gentleman in the front here. Thank you. Christopher Graves with Ogilvy. A quick question for Martin. I doubt it's quick. I apologize. For, for Martin and Mike first, I never heard mention of Pakistan. And I'd wonder what role that might play in a second term for Obama. And for Ken, who would China prefer, a Romney president or a second term Obama? I'll say a brief word on Pakistan. Uh, obviously, very challenging. I think that our Afghanistan policy, to some extent, could fail, as I said earlier, partly because of Pakistan's role. That plus the politics in Kabul and the future of Karzai are the key threats to the mission, I think. Uh, in terms of the U.S.-Pakistan partnership, I, th I give this administration reasonably decent grades for keeping on trying when nothing was working. <laughs> and um, on Afghanistan, I think their messaging and their teamwork was relatively mediocre. By contrast, towards Pakistan, I think the strategic dialogue and a lot of the outreach was pretty good. Now, the two issues are interlinked, so mistakes we made on messaging in Afghanistan affected Pakistan policy, I believe. So I don't want to completely establish a distinction between the two. But I think this administration has been extremely mature and disciplined and realist on Pakistan. We don't have any choice but to keep working the relationship. There have been things that have gone up and down along the way. Bruce Rydell has some very good ideas, I think, on where we should go next with Pakistan. Certainly not disengagement. Um, you got to keep trying, and that's what they've been doing. Well, on, on uh, Obama versus Romney on China, the Chinese clearly prefer Obama. Uh, but that's for two reasons. One is they always prefer the person they know. Uh, if they have a reasonably good relationship with them, and Obama's worked very hard on that relationship. But secondly, uh, Romney has moved pretty far in the direction that Bill Clinton moved in his campaign uh, <coughs> his first time around, and made a bunch of specific comments about what he would do, uh, all of which are real sources of trouble with China if he actually moved ahead and did them. Uh, so you don't know whether he'll try to back off, but when you get specific in campaign promises, they tend to come back to bite you. And so Romney has said, for example, he would declare China a currency manipulator on day one. Uh, he, he actually doesn't have the authority to do that if he were president, but, but setting that aside, uh, it's, a, it's a potential problem. So I think on balance, they'd rather stick with the guy they know. OK. Lady right there in green. In-house, Diana Negroponte, multilateralism. Are we getting tired of it, or will we keep up the effort? Uh, sure. I, I, well, well, one of the big issues on multilateralism is not only at, the, at a global level, but at a regional level. And uh, one of the things you see in Asia, certainly, and I think to some extent elsewhere around the world, the Arab League and so forth, is regional organizations that traditionally are feckless are now becoming actually fairly active and important. Uh, my sense is in Asia, the Obama administration has, has come to a very conscious strategy of kind of picking the multilateral platforms that it wants to see play a, a major role and others that it would like to see uh, more marginalized. Uh, and so in Asia, the East Asia Summit, we have now moved front and center, especially on Asian security issues. We're trying to build a platform on the economic and trade side called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so I, I would say they, they bought into regional multilateral organizations, at least in Asia, very strongly, but with a real strategy behind that. It's not multilateralism for the sake of multilateralism. It's how do you advance American interests with particular multilateral organizations and move them ahead. What's, what's a, just as a quick coda, what's interesting in, in this Arab awakening is that, you know, in terms of looking for partners, who would have thought we'd be working with the Arab League? Yep which was a particularly feckless organization, suddenly has, has become uh, an important actor in this. Well, let me just ask, because that's an interesting question. In, as I recall, in the Bush years, multilateralism tended to be defined as the United Nations. Um, I would say this administration looks from the outside to be a little frustrated with the UN Security Council. I think that uh, Secretary Clinton made some very strong negative statements about the utility of the UN Security Council. Do you foresee... <coughs> Uh, and, and Martin, you mentioned that, that, that they might undertake an Iran strike, with, probably without UN Security Council. Said with that, I said I'm that. Well, sure. would you disagree? But it, well, let me just sure. let me just ask. Don't forget do you that see... Obama, one of his signal successes, was getting the Russians and Chinese right. to vote for 
a UN Security Council resolution on Iran that imposed harsh sanctions on Iran. No, I realize that. So, so my question is, what's, where do you see the trend going? Toward, toward greater attention to the UN Security Council or lesser attention to the UN Security Council? I, I just think that, that you know, Obama's vision is of a, of a multilateral order in which the United States will still play a leading role, but uh, he recognizes that, that the name of the game has changed and he has to engage with <coughs> these other powers, these rising powers, whether it be China or India. Um, and, and it plays inevitably a major playing field for this uh, in, engagement with uh, rising powers is going to be the Security Council. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think we have any choice about that because of the nature of the shifting balance of power. Uh, the, the, the days, and, and I think this is right, I think you would even agree to this, which is the days of, of Bush, George W. Bush-style unilateralism are essentially over. And, and the, the desire to have legitimacy for our, our military interventions is very strong, certainly in this administration, but I wonder... That whether it would be that different, uh, simply because the way that the balance of power has shifted. Well, it was also Bill Clinton who went to war without a UN Security Council authorization when you couldn't get it. And, and I would say, in response to what you said, not that I'm supposed to be responding, but that <laughs> the trend of most of, of recent American presidents has been, some, I think you could summarize their policy in the way that the Clinton people summarized their policy. Get a UN Security Council resolution when you can, but when you can't, find another way to legitimize it. Using regional organizations, by the way, whether it's NATO, uh, whether it's the Arab League. Um, sure. And so I would say I'm not so sure Obama is any more in a, in a, uh, theoretically in, uh, committed to a UN Security Council than, than past presidents have been. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Mike, did you want to make one? I want to get to some Said more questions. Said it better than I. OK, yeah, no, I, I doubt that. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I write the Mitchell Report, and I want to build on the, the two questions that Bob asked, one at the outset and the, and the last uh, one about grades. Uh, he asked at the outset, you know, what's the, what's the purpose or the end goal of pragmatism, which I think is a, a, an actually a pretty interesting question. So you have described Obama as a pragmatic progressive or the other way around. Uh, put him in context with people uh, with whom we have a little bit more historical perspective. If he, and, and if you want to think about this while you're fielding other questions, that's great. If he's a pragmatic progressive, uh, what is Eisenhower's brand? What is Rick, Nick, Nixon's and what is Ronald Reagan? Do you want to mull or do you want to answer? <laughs> I'll, take a, I'll take a brief crack, okay. although I'm going to take the liberty of answering at about 10 degrees incidence from your question. Uh, because, uh, Gary, what I was driving at earlier when I said I think Obama's done much better than Clinton in terms of the first three years of each presidency, I think Obama's done better than most post-World War II presidents on balance for the first three years. And one of the reasons is uh, adaptiveness. And so I think the, <coughs> again, Martin prefers the term uh, progressive pragmatist. And, uh, and I prefer the term reluctant realist, but they're sort of two sides of the same coin. I think that the way in which he has recognized that his big visions, which I think he believed even more than most candidates, and certainly articulated with more forcefulness and believability than most candidates in the modern era, uh, I think he realized fairly quickly he wasn't going to be able to make a lot of progress on all of them. And uh, a chapter that my colleagues wrote uh, but that I'm a big fan of, uh, is the chapter on the rogue states. We talked about Iran. We talked only a little about North Korea today when Ken mentioned it. But basically, Obama figured out pretty quickly in the first six months of his presidency that his effort to reach out a hand to those who would unclench their own fist wasn't being taken up. And when North Korea detonated a nuclear weapon and Iran stole a presidential election, he quickly pivoted. He used the UN Security Council. He used the fact that the world saw him as having made a genuine effort to reach out and he became a very effective, reluctant realist. And so I'll come back to that, uh, that phraseology, but I think he's a fast learner as well as the other things that we've said. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I'm sure Obama would rather be known as a progressive pragmatist than a reluctant realist. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just my, it's just my guess here. Yes, ma'am, right there. Uh, Judith Falk. With the recent visit of Netanyahu 
how would you assess Obama's policies toward Israel and <coughs> the Israeli concern about Iran's nuclear capabilities? I guess I've got to answer that one. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> uh, I think I've already, I've already answered uh, uh, the Iran issue in terms of the way that the president sees it. He doesn't see it as about only about Israel's security. He sees it very much as, as a, uh, a world order issue um, and uh, the critical importance of disarmament and non-proliferation in his own mind for the order that he's trying to shape. Um, but when it comes to, to Israel, you know, the president um, had a theory of the case. And I think we haven't remarked on this of the in, kind of internal workings of, of a foreign policy within the Obama administration, but this is a president who drives foreign policy. He's, he's more, I think, directly involved in, in determining um, the foreign policy of the country <coughs> than any president uh, since Richard Nixon. I think that's as far back as you have to go for that kind of hands-on engagement. Um, and when it came to Israel, he had a theory of the case, which uh, proved to be wrong. His theory of the case was the United States needs to rebuild its relationships and reputation in the Muslim world because we're engaged in two wars in the greater Middle East, in the Muslim world. And that's important for American interests. Um, and uh, therefore, he would distance himself from Israel in order to curry favor with the Arabs. Um, and he's expressed this as, as something that would end up being good for Israel because it could bring the Arabs around to being more uh, prepared to engage with Israel. Um, it, was, it was the wrong theory of the case. Uh, and, by, and by the way, I should add, he thought that he could take care of Israel's concerns by uh, meeting Israel's security requirements 100%. And he always did that. Um, you know, he thought that what they cared about was security. What he didn't understand was what they really cared about was affection. <laughs> they wanted to be loved. They'd had 16 years of unalloyed affection from Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. And now this president is turning away from them and going after the other woman. And they didn't like it. <laughs> and they didn't like it, not just the right wing. The left wing didn't like it um, in Israel. In fact... Obama's standing in Israel after his Cairo speech plummeted down to single digits. And it only started to recover. It's actually <coughs> now up at around 50 55% when he gave that speech in the United Nations last year, which was kind of diametrically opposed to the, the Cairo speech. He embraced the Israeli uh, narrative of, of Israel's history, um, whereas in the Cairo speech, he embraced the Palestinian narrative. And, and so, essentially, what happened was, having lost the Israeli public quite early on, Netanyahu, who eats polls for breakfast, um, figured out that he could actually gain more by standing up to this president than, than by uh, agreeing to what he wanted. And indeed, at that famous moment when he upbraided the president in the, in the White House, he went up 10 points in Israeli public opinion, which is unheard of. In, in the uh, relationship of, of Israelis to American presidents, because they know the bottom line is they depend on the American president for their security at the end of the day. So essentially, um, what happened was he, he lost the Israeli public. He therefore lost his ability to exercise effective leverage on Netanyahu. And when he, he theref thereby failed to deliver on the Israeli side, he lost the Arab public as well, because they don't want the US president to distance himself from Israel. They want the US president to deliver Israel. And, and when he didn't do either, I mean, they turned their backs on him too. So he ended up with the worst of both worlds. Neither, you know, his, his support in the Arab world today, notwithstanding everything he did on Mubarak and so on, is, is, is also down in the double digits. Do you want to end the 1020? Or do you? Okay. More questions? Yes, sir. Right here in the middle. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, Martin, following up on that question, how is it that the president got himself in a position of promising that we would have a framework agreement within 12 months, knowing that the, was a, there was a key obstacle, namely a settlement freeze, uh, and doing nothing about it, having no backup plan in the event the Israelis refused, as they did, to extend the settlement freeze? How did that come about? Well, it's a long story. We try to de detail it in the book, but, but um, you know, essentially, I, I, I have a different view about the settlements freeze than, than the kind of conventional wisdom now. I don't think it was a mistake to go for a settlements freeze. It was important in the context uh, of, of the time where settlements had been particularly deleterious to the effort to, to try to achieve a breakthrough, uh, where Palestinian Authority had, had been doing a credible job on their commitments under the roadmap to fight terrorism. And Israel had an obligation under the roadmap to, to freeze all settlement activity. The problem was in making that, the, the, turning it in, in a sense into a precondition, and then the president giving uh, his special Middle East envoy, George Mitchell, the ability, that the, the uh, instructions to go and negotiate something less than a full settlements freeze with Netanyahu, which took 10 months. And, and in the end, they came up with what was an important uh, moratorium on, on all settlement activity in the West Bank. That was quite an achievement. But failing to <coughs> adjust from the rhetoric of a full settlements freeze to the actual settlements moratorium that they ended up achieving created a situation in which when they came out with this, the Arabs all said, well, what's that? That's not what you promised us. The Palestinians said, well, we can't enter negotiations. You promised us a full settlements freeze. And so there again you have this highlight between the expectations generated by the rhetoric of the president um, and this pragmatism involving working out a deal that leads to a, a gap between what he, what he promised and what he delivered. And that, I think, was the heart of the problem in terms of the way it impacted very negatively on the chances of getting a negotiation going. Okay, I'm looking for a non-Middle East peace yeah, process please. question. <laughs> so only if you have your hand up for a non-Middle East peace process question. <laughs> yes, sir, the gentleman right there in the third row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'm Sean Tannen. I'm a reporter with the AFP News Agency. Uh, this is something that actually, Dr. Ikein, you've, you've addressed uh, probably more than the others, but something that's come up here, the idea of American decline. Um, is this something that you've seen evolve in in, uh, in Obama's first term, the trying to address the perceptions that some have, China, for example, of that the United States is de in decline? Do you see this as something that's evolved, and how could that change in, the, in a potential second term? I think the pivot point here was when I read Bob Kagan's article. <laughs> uh, seriously, I, I think uh, he has focused more on highlighting that America will play a leadership role globally uh, for the long-term future as his administration has gone along, as he's kind of gotten his footing, uh, potentially, I don't know this from personal contact, but potentially became more appreciative of the, of the reality that if you don't convey optimism and dynamism about the future, it actually weakens you in the present. Uh, the shadow of the future is large. Uh, and certainly at this point, he points, I think, by the way, absolutely rightly, to the reality that in most dimensions of power and of the things you would look at to project future power, America remains utterly extraordinary. Uh, what is screwed up are two things. One is our national politics, our ability to make tough decisions, and B, the reality that within <coughs> the coming decade, we have crushing fiscal problems if we don't take steps now to change the trajectory. Uh, and so those are the two Achilles heels. And if we can't, and, what, and the second obviously is depending on the first, and if we can't change the trajectory on, on the national politics and therefore the, the, if you will, national compact on how we're going to address our fiscal problems, Frankly, our enormous advantages are going to erode over time more rapidly than any of us would like to see. So I think he is stressing the positive, but he recognizes, I think, full well that uh, in the wake of this election, 
he has got to be able to develop a capacity to take very tough decisions on everything from entitlements to security to, to tax reform, et cetera, and put together a package that, that is realistic about the future or we're going to be in serious trouble. Aren't you going to do your thing on America's strength? No, I think that's a great answer. I think uh, there are a lot of strengths. We talk about them in the book, but there's no getting away from the urgency of this task. Uh, yes, sir, over here. Going back to this last question. Yeah, sure. This is going to have to be the last question, so. Jim Matlack, the American as as Friends like. Service Committee. <laughs> Do Cuba, Chavez in Venezuela, Mexico verging toward a failed state, or any other issue south of our border matter at all in relation to the things you've been discussing? Can I start on that? Please. Please. Yeah. We do address a couple of things. I'm glad you raised this, because uh, we haven't <coughs> talked at all about Africa or Latin America. And we do relatively little on the book on those matters, partly because Obama's done relatively little uh, as president in those areas. On Chavez and Castro, I give him an A plus for figuring out the right policy was to ignore these guys. And he made one effort vis-a-vis -vis Chavez, uh, as we'll all recall from early in his presidency. Uh, and basically, otherwise, has allowed these policies to be tertiary priorities at best, which is exactly where they belong. There are a few things perhaps he could have done to uh, be a little bit more proactive vis-a-vis -vis our friends in Latin America. But I think ignoring Chavez and Castro was the right thing to do on balance and was basically his policy. Towards Mexico, by contrast, I think that both towards Mexico and Colombia, in fact, where we've had big violence, drug uh, problems in recent years, Obama's role has not been nearly as distinctive as either of his two predecessors so far. And uh, I don't have the right policy in mind for what he should do in either place. Colombia is at a point where it doesn't need as much American help as it once did. So it's really just by way of noting that Obama didn't need to do as much as Clinton or Bush with Plan Colombia. On Mexico, obviously, he needs to figure out a way to do more. Uh, but we haven't yet come up with that proposal. And it's an interconnected policy. It's tied into things like immigration reform, where he's had very difficult going. It's tied into issues uh, like trade agreements, where he's had a tough go. So I think I will simply say that on this issue, uh, he's been so far distinctive for what he hasn't done. And you know, there are a lot of policies in the world where a, a three-year president can't have made a big mark. But this is getting to be a bit overdue for where he's going to have to do more or, or where his successor will have to do more. Well, with that, let me just say that uh, if you've you know, gotten a flavor of the depth and breadth of wisdom here about this administration and about these policies in general, it's just a small taste of what is in this book, uh, which I really commend to you. It's, it's the only book of its kind out there right now that really does this kind of, I think, very sober and balanced assessment of the Obama administration. I hope you'll join me in congratulating and thanking our panelists here.